This webinar is produced by UNHCR, IFRC, UNICEF, IOM, and the Ready Initiative. During this webinar, we do encourage you to ask questions and provide comments directly in the chat. We are also happy to provide live interpretation into Spanish, Arabic, and French for today's webinar. If you're interested in listening to the session in one of these languages, please click the globe icon that says interpretation on your Zoom screen and select your desired language. Access to today's recording will be available after the webinar on the RCCE Collective Service website and ready-initiative.org. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Catherine Bertram, Senior Social Behavior Change Advisor with the Ready Initiative. Catherine. Great. Thank you so much, Laura, and welcome everyone to this webinar on risk communication and community engagement on COVID-19 vaccines for marginalized populations, with a spotlight on indigenous populations and refugees. This webinar, um, as was mentioned, is organized by UNHCR, UNICEF, IOM, IFRC, and the Ready Initiative as part of the Risk Communication and Community Engagement Collective Service webinar series. These agencies lead global uh, working groups focusing on community engagement in low resource settings and on refugees, IDPs, migrants, and host communities. We're really excited to have with us today an expert in behavioral science related to vaccine uptake, who will lead us through discussions with a fascinating set of panelists who are using their energies to make sure people in vulnerable situations are not left behind in COVID-19 vaccination efforts. They will share their experiences engaging hard to reach indigenous populations, refugees and others around COVID-19 vaccine access and acceptance. This webinar coincides with the recent launch of a new interagency guidance on risk communication and community engagement for COVID-19 vaccines with considerations specifically for refugees, migrants, internally displaced persons, people with disabilities, older people, LGBTQI plus populations, people living in insecure areas, indigenous populations, and others. You can take a look at the full list. Um, I will put a link in the chat. Um, these are not small numbers, by the way. There was an estimated 82.4 million forcibly displaced people worldwide in 2020. The ICRC estimates that more than 60 million people live in areas controlled by non-state armed groups who risk not being included in national vaccine distributions. This guide doesn't have all of the answers and there's no one size fits all approach, but you can find vetted expert advice for further exploration. So aligned with this guidance, this discussion aims to really underscore the need for advocacy for fair and equitable access and distribution of vaccines to all people and inclusiveness in plans and activities. It is timely as we're all working hard to understand and address the barriers to vaccine uptake in an environment where access and delivery systems are severely lacking in some places. And yet even when available for many who have been marginalized, there is also some cases um, where there are deeply held sus suspicions of authority and health systems, traditional and cultural considerations and communication needs um, involving different literacy levels, many different languages um, and different formats. Um, there are issues with registration due to a lack of identification, digital divides, fear of legal consequences and discrimination, to name just a few of the many challenges. We know we need a data-informed, tailored, community-led approach, approach to be our most effective. But how is that achieved given all of these complexities? It's partly art, science, hard work, relationships. We'll explore some of that today. Our panelists include Mr. Julio Mendigere. He's executive director of indigenous or native peoples in the Ministry of Health of Peru. Dr. Mefta Lawo, um, the assistant public health officer for UNHCR in Libya. And Ms. Asil Hamuda, uh, she's a community mobilizer in, in Libya. Nicole Grable, she specializes in social and behavior change and public health with Mercy Corps. Diana Hachico, Hachicho, um, she's a WASH uh, m &E and field officer with a local organization in Lebanon, Development for People and Nature Association. 
and Susanna uh, Buxam. Uh, she's a registered nurse with Save the Children. Closing this session will be Noreen Nakvi of UNICEF. Our panel is moderated by Dr. Rapali LeMay. She's Associate Scientist, Director of Behavioral and Implementation Science with Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Rupali LeMay to get us started with the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's wonderful to be here and it's great to have so many participants joining. Please do feel free to use the chat to ask questions because I know the panelists would like to engage with you all. As Catherine mentioned, my name is Rupali LeMay. I'm trained as a behavioral and social scientist, and I serve as a faculty member in the departments of International Health Epidemiology and Health Behavior and Society at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I've been studying risk communication and health communication for almost 20 years, starting my career in traditional advertising and then moving into the health space. So I want to start with just a few opening remarks because I know we're very interested to hear from the panelists and especially the context from different situations and context around the globe. So with regards to vaccine acceptance and risk communication, prior to COVID, there were essentially four key reasons why individuals would be hesitant or would think about maybe not getting a vaccine. The first really focused on vaccine ingredients. Many individuals look at vaccine ingredients, have concerns about them, and essentially decide because of those ingredients, they do not want to receive a vaccine. The second is related to the vaccine schedule. Pre-COVID, hesitancy was essentially related to childhood vaccination. Many parents were worried about the number of vaccines and the number of doses that their children receive over the course of their lifetime. The third key issue that we saw, again, pre-COVID, was really focused on this misperception that there is a link between vaccines and severe adverse events such as autism. Although the study that came out that indicated that there was a link between these two things has been retracted, and there have been numbers of studies, scores of studies, I would say, that have refuted this fact, this myth still persists. We still hear this from individuals across the globe, not only in higher income settings, but in lower and middle income settings as well. The fourth reason why individuals were hesitant pre-COVID was risk perception. And what I mean by that is that individuals did not feel that they were susceptible to the disease that the vaccine was designed to prevent. And even if they were susceptible, did not think the disease was severe enough to warrant them taking an action, i.e. getting the vaccine. So the question is, how has this changed? So that was pre-COVID, essentially four key reasons why individuals were hesitant towards vaccines. Now, in the context of COVID, we still continue to hear these issues, but we hear some additional issues that have arose. The first I would focus on is vaccine confidence. There are many, many questions from individuals related to the development process of the vaccine itself, the clinical trials, the recruitment of participants, and as well as whether or not the vaccine is actually effective specifically for them. The second key issue that we're starting to grapple with more and more is mistrust. This is mistrust in science itself. This is coupled with an increase of an anti-science sentiment and view across the world. But in addition, this is mistrust towards the healthcare system, which includes not only doctors, but includes frontline workers, nurses, community workers, and other individuals that individuals may engage with to seek health care. The issue with this is not only due to distrust because of past experiences, perhaps specific marginalized groups specifically have been discriminated against, but also current discrimination practices that has led to a large distrust towards government in general, including healthcare systems. The third key issue with regards to the COVID-19 context is misinformation and disinformation. I'm sure many of you all are aware of the amounts of misinformation that are being spread primarily through social media platforms. As individuals are grappling through a very uncertain context, meaning we're learning about the COVID-19 virus every day, we're learning more and more about transmission as well as treatment options, individuals are looking for information because they want to reduce that uncertainty in their lives. As a result, many individuals are turning to social media 
which is not usually evidence-based information. And this is a key challenge for those of us that are working in risk communication. The last two things I wanna end with before we start our panel is two key approaches I think that should be considered when we think about risk communication regardless of where we are, regardless of who we're speaking with, and regardless of what we are speaking about. The one thing I have learned over this pandemic, I have spoken to likely more than 5,000 individuals that are vaccine hesitant. And the most important thing that we can do from a public health perspective and a healthcare systems perspective is to make sure that we're expressing empathy. Individuals have questions because they're trying to make sense of this virus and how they can best protect themselves as well as their family members and their communities. As a result, it's important that we focus on empathy through every single interpersonal communication encounter that we engage in. The second is related to equity. As we focus on humanitarian populations today, it's very important to discuss and think about innovative ways in which we can ensure that individuals in marginalized settings, perhaps in humanitarian settings specifically, not only have access to the vaccine itself, but have access to evidence-based information. We know that equity is a huge issue with regards to supply, but we also know that equity is a huge issue with regards to information to create demand. Those are my remarks for today. We're very excited about this panel. And I'm going to start now with Dr. Julio Mendeguere, who is the Executive Director of Indigenous or Native Peoples within the Ministry of Health in Peru. Dr. Mendeguere, I understand that vaccinating the last mile population has been challenging in many, many aspects, and more specifically with remote indig indigenous populations who normally have specific perceptions and their own understanding about disease. Can you please describe the joint work that you have been working on through the Ministry of Health and the Red Cross to focus on this issue? Muchas gracias. Muy buenos días. Eh, solo para precisar, yo soy el director de pueblos indígenas u originarios del Ministerio de Salud del Perú. Represento al Estado eh, y quiero expresar el saludo a la Cruz Roja Internacional y todos los participantes. El saludo del ministro de Salud, el doctor Hernando Ceballos Flores. Eh, en el Perú tenemos 55 pueblos indígenas. 51 son amazónicos, 4 andinos y el trabajo de planificación en el país eh, significa vacunar a unas 309 mil personas eh, indígenas eh, que viven en lugares muy lejanos, en poblaciones dispersas, en lugares eh, y en distritos de frontera con Brasil, Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia y Chile. Y eh, tal como venía explicando la doctora Limaye, eh, efectivamente eh, la confianza de la población ha sido erosionada por información distorsionada, eh, incompleta y también evidentemente con mensajes eh, de la teoría de conspiración que hemos escuchado en todas partes. Eh, y esto ha afectado severamente porque... Hasta este momento, si bien el Perú ha avanzado con la vacunación y ya tiene casi 60 mil ciudadanos indígenas vacunados con las dos dosis, eh, todavía tenemos un, una brecha importante por uh, cubrirla. Ya no tenemos problema de acceso a la vacuna, porque esa ya la tenemos, las dosis de vacunas suficientes. Tenemos ahora problemas de persuasión, de convencimiento, Y allí quiero destacar el rol importante de la Cruz Roja, porque aquí ha sido un aliado importante para preparar a la población antes de la vacunación, que significa establecer un protocolo para que el personal de salud que no tiene formación en interculturalidad, sino en medicina occidental, en principio respete los conocimientos ancestrales valore la cosmovisión, interactúe adecuadamente y además en su propia lengua. En ese proceso hemos elaborado un protocolo de vacunación. También se han hecho con la asistencia técnica de nuestros colegas de la Cruz Roja, la elaboración de productos comunicacionales 
eh, infografías, mensajes, rotafolios, banners, spots radiales, incluso se han contratado pautas en las radios locales para que estos mensajes lleguen a la población en su propia lengua originaria. Y obviamente hemos incluido a más eh, instituciones del Estado y también del sector privado. En adición a eso, hemos fomentado la participación de las organizaciones indígenas, de la propia comunidad. Esto es algo que ocurría en el Perú, pero que nadie se daba cuenta de que la planificación, la ejecución de las actividades se hacían de manera vertical desde el nivel central, desde el Ministerio de Salud, y los líderes indígenas estaban relegados y no tenían participación activa. Nosotros, durante la pandemia, los hemos incluido y hemos instaurado lo que hoy se denomina aquí Comando COVID Indígena. Es un espacio de diálogo, es un espacio de coordinación, eh, de, donde participan las principales organizaciones indígenas, representan eh, a sus comunidades, participan los líderes, y junto con ellos recorremos las comunidades nativas, llevando la vacunación, lleva, llevando el mensaje de esperanza, eh, llevando la, la, todo el material comunicacional. Y de esta manera vamos persuadiendo a la población para que acepten la vacunación. Obviamente esto es un trabajo mucho más laborioso porque hay que eh, cruzar a los ríos, caminar muchas horas por las carreteras. En algunos lugares hay que llegar por vía aérea para llegar a las comunidades. Y esto requiere más recursos, requiere más personal, requiere más información y requiere mucho más articulación. En este esfuerzo el Estado lidera, por supuesto, el, el proceso de vacunación viendo como un derecho, no como un servicio del Estado. Y allí ha sido clave, importante, la participación de la Cruz Roja Internacional. Y yo quisiera y deseo de todo corazón, en nombre del Estado peruano, expresar nuestra gratitud a la Federación Internacional de la Cruz Roja Peruana, a todas uh, las personas de buen corazón que han contribuido para que las vacunas el personal de salud, principalmente enfermeras, técnicos, médicos, lleguen hasta las comunidades y ellos puedan acceder a la vacunación y de esta forma podamos lograr en el país la inmunidad comunitaria que es el anhelo del Perú y obviamente eh, en el mundo entero. Si ustedes me permiten, tal como había solicitado a los organizadores, además de estas hermosas imágenes que ustedes están apreciando donde ven el trabajo colaborativo entre el Estado, la Cruz Roja Internacional, la propia comunidad, los, eh, eh, las autoridades de los niveles subregionales. Tengo otro video que puede expresar esto que he señalado en forma resumida del esfuerzo que hace el Estado por llevar la vacunación a los pueblos indígenas. Muchas gracias y quedo atento para cualquier pregunta o comentario de los participantes. And thank you again, Dr. Mendegare. That was a very interesting, I think, and thought provo provoking discussion about how really to collaborate. I know there are several questions in the chat for you, so hopefully you'll be able to get to those. I'm going to move over and move on to Dr. Lawell of UNHCR. Thank you for joining us today. We understand that initially in Libya, you thought that it was important to rely on the humanitarian buffer for refugees as well as asylum seekers and internally displaced individuals. Can you briefly set the scene for us in Libya and tell us about the efforts of how you advocated for refugee IDP inclusion in the government's plan for vaccination? Over to you, Dr. Lawell. Dr. Lawell, I believe that your audio may be muted. Hi there. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for uh, organizing uh, this webinar. Unfortunately, uh, it was 
a moment of disconnection. That's why I, I couldn't speak uh, promptly. So going to uh, the experience of UNICEF Libya and vaccination, uh, I will not take uh, much time. Uh, for the first obstacle was in the beginning of 2021 when most of the, of the, of the world started to uh, procure uh, vaccinations and start the campaigning. The first obstacle we, we faced that uh, we were requested to provide vaccines through the humanitarian buffer. So uh, UNHCR, IOM, UNICEF, WHO, we started the advocacy to include refugees and asylum seekers in addition to migrants within the national vaccination program. This, it actually took months to include refugees and uh, migrants into the national deployment plan successfully in June. And late July, the vaccination campaign started for uh, non-Libyans, regardless their uh, residential status and uh, their uh, ethnic, uh, ethnical background. Uh, to a certain level, it goes fine. Uh, the, the challenge that we have is with the obtaining uh, the statistics. The government so far hasn't shared a detailed statistic per nationality. So our, our source of data now is community mobilizers like uh, Asir, who joined later, and the other community mobilizers, and also uh, health outreach teams that we managed to collect a few, few information to, to enhance uh, uh, the process. That, uh, the challenges we were faced uh, at the beginning is the vaccine hesitancy as many parts of the world, and also the questioning of they might go to the vaccination center and will be uh, rejected if they are not Libyans or they don't, they don't hold uh, a valid passport. And uh, luckily we managed to negotiate with the, uh, with the Libyan health authorities to accept any sort of ID. So units here at the station, although it's, not, it's still not recognized by the Libyan authorities, but during the vaccine it was accepted as a, a valid ID to register uh, asylum seekers and refugees who don't have uh, a valid passport. Uh, the, uh, the acceptance rate uh, is still the challenges now, mainly if you're gonna give, give them in, in, in order, order number one will be uh, uh, the reaching point is sometimes a security concern or transportation. For transportation, we managed to advocate of having vaccination points near to area highly populated with uh, people of concern. But for security, sometimes we cannot obtain it as the, we give the whole support as, as some of the asylum seekers. And recently it was heard that uh, a mass raid happened in Libya and unfortunately that affected the process. But even though we continue to provide continuous awareness, it's through focus group discussion with community mobilizers, and also lately a video was shared with uh, one of the main vaccination points in Tripoli to encourage people to come and vaccinate as long as the vaccination campaign is, go is ongoing. And uh, non-Libyans, regardless of their uh, background, they have access to, uh, to, to vaccination. I stop at this point to allow time for if we have any questions to, to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lawell. Um, appreciate you giving your perspective on, on what is happening specifically in Libya. Um, I will ask individuals to, if there are any questions, to please place them in the chat. Um, and if not, I think Dr. Lawell, we will, we will continue to, to move on to keep us moving. But if there are questions, we hopefully will also have a little bit of time at the end to come back if there are specific questions for, for the case in, in Libya. Thank you so much. So I'd like thank you to, very much. Yes, thank you, thank you. I'd like to turn over to our next panelist. Um, so Ms. Hamouda, um, can you share with us your experiences still within the context of Libya, but as a community mobilizer there? Um, how have you specifically been able to work with refugees um, to access so that they are able to access the COVID-19 vaccines. And can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you have faced and how you were able to overcome those challenges with regards to vaccine access? So over to you, Ms. Hamouda. Uh, I think uh, the biggest challenge was uh, convincing people to get vaccinated because I think the problem is people aren't educated enough to even decide what they want to believe because of like the rumors. Uh, people are hesitant because the vaccine is new. 
because when I had the discussion with them, they uh, they they want to vaccinate their babies and their children, but they don't want to get vaccinated uh, the COVID nineteen vaccine because it's new. Some people want to see how it works on other people first. Um, some people are hesitant, but when you convince them, uh, when you try to have a discussion with them and uh, explain how the vaccine works and uh, tell them that uh, getting vaccinated is better than getting the virus, they, some of them get convinced and some others are just scared. So having discussions with them uh, helps sometimes. And uh, yeah, they can reach uh, the uh, they can reach the vaccines easily now, especially after the vaccines are available now. Great, thank you so so much. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you. And again, if there are questions for um, for Ms. Hamuda, to also please include them in the chat. Um, and we'll continue to try to monitor the chat to answer those questions. So we'll move on to the next panelist. Um, so now we'll move over to talk to Ms. Grable, um, who has been working with Mercy Corps. Um, and so Ms. Grable, your efforts of working with Mercy Corps, I think really highlight a community-led approach to think about the ways in which we can promote and try to move towards vaccine acceptance in humanitarian settings and other hard to reach settings. Um, can you give us a quick tour of this process, of this approach, and maybe just touch on a few examples um, that you all have worked on at the country level? So over to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Uh, I think Catherine's going to share a couple of slides from her side and uh, but just for background, my name is Nicole Grable, and I've been supporting Mercy Corps for the last year and a half on social and behavior change in public health, and in particular, the COVID response and COVID vaccines. Uh, I'll share an example of our process uh, intertwined with a country example, so I'll do both of those at one time. The example that I'll share is uh, with working with my colleagues in Iraq. And this is specific to our community-led approach in East and West Mosul and Telki. And this is in particular overlaid within their existing work in social cohesion. So this is overlaid within our peace and conflict work. And uh, this is in particular with uh, a human-centered design approach so Catherine, if you can go to the next slide, I'll jump straight into the process. So our preparation uh, started back at, earlier in the year where uh, we did a desk review to first identify and understand all of the existing information that was available and accessible. The teams went through a, a social and behavior change and infodemic training uh, that I led with a, a variety of other guest lectures from outside organizations. We did an assessment in the communities and looked at a, a variety of ways to understand the information that we got back. We did a psychobehavioral segmentation for the different groupings based on the qualitative data. So we were able to bucket uh, information that would need to be shared out for different strategic approaches based on uh, groupings for enthusiasts, access dependent, those people who were watchful or understanding what others were doing, and then people that just simply had a lot of questions that needed to be answered. We looked at uh, skeptics, and then we looked at people who might be uh, falling into understanding and, and believing some of those uh, conspiracy theories that were floating around. So that helped our teams really focus uh, efforts on how to respond. We, of course, did a stakeholder analysis to understand who else was working in the space, and then uh, coordinated with the the director of public health uh, within the division of vaccination and immunization. The teams went through a train the trainer process where it, this was based on uh, understanding misinformation, which of course our colleagues working in this space are quite familiar with, and uh, COVID overall, uh, COVID vaccines, how community leaders can respond, and then uh, the interpersonal communication. Uh, in addition to that, they were trained on how to do the human-centered design approach within communities. Uh, so that was how the teams were prepped before we even went into the field to do implementation. Next slide, please. 
So the next process was that my colleagues trained 28 community committee members that were already part of their existing program. So they already had a strong relationship with these individuals and those people had strong relationships within the communities. They did a four day training on advocacy, social cohesion, COVID-19 and vaccines. And they led those uh, individuals through a human centered design approach, which is deeply rooted in that empathy piece that we want to be sure that those questions, concerns and the process was really drawn out from those people who were participating in that design process. So those community committee members who were deeply connected with the communities already were then taken through a process design to design hyper-focused community engagement strategies. Who did they feel were the people that they could reach? Who did they feel were the most vulnerable? What were the behaviors, whether it be mask wearing, vaccine acceptance, if it's hand washing, if it's physical distancing, what were those specific things that they felt like based on all of the training that they went through? Uh, what did they feel they needed to impact the most? What could they do? realistically in real time. And so these people were also taken through that similar training for COVID-19 and vaccine. So that was to elevate those high risk groups. Uh, what were those key prevention behaviors? What was the information about vaccines that they could share? And we used both WHO technical content and information from the Directorate of Health. And those individuals took that technical content and then created that into their own context specific information that they felt like they could articulate with people in their communities that would be relevant. From there, those people then went out and did implementation in communities. So they hold community sessions around vaccine equity, where they talk with community members about what are the issues? Is it around uh, access centers? Is it around different vaccines being available in different places? How could we make it more equitable? And since this has happened, they've since been able to open up more distribution, uh, vaccine distribution centers, as well as make more vaccines available throughout more places. Uh, they hold community community sessions where they have dialogue discussions. There are a, variety, a, a handful of individuals that go on a rotation through East and West Mosul and Tel Keith and hold 15 uh, person sessions where they address misinformation and uh, around vaccines. We do social media monitoring. So we analyze what's going on in the media and we collect that feedback from both the advocacy sessions and the community sessions. And we analyze that to see what's being discussed both in media and in the community feedback. That information is then rolled into uh, what community health workers go out and talk about door to door with community members. Uh, so on, on that note, I'll, I'll pause, um, but I'm happy to discuss any questions. If you have any questions in the chat, please let me know. And I can put this full presentation in the chat, um, as well as a, a link to the facilitation tools and all of our training materials is at the end of that presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Grable. It was great to see the process that you all undertook and it sounds like it was quite an extensive but very lovely participatory process to get to this point. Again, if there are questions, I think there are some questions that might be in the chat. Um, please do drop them in the chat if you have additional questions. Thank you again. Okay, I'd like to turn it over now to our colleagues that are in Lebanon, Ms. Hachicho and Ms. Buxam. So mistrust and misinformation, which several panelists have touched upon, are, are real concerns, I think, in all of our vaccine-related work, not only in Lebanon, but globally. What approaches are you using to increase um, vaccine uptake among refugees, as well as marginalized populations that you work with, including not only registration, but also access? So Mitch Hachichu, please, let's start over uh, with you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rapali. Um, I am Diana Hashisho, and I have been working in the humanitarian sector in Lebanon for the past year. I would like to first give an introduction about the country context. Um, we are currently living in the harshest times in Lebanon, economically, socially, and politically. We have a dismantled government, broken health care, educational and political systems, which in turn led to distrust. Basically, no one believes anyone. Some community members reach the level of believing that COVID-19 is actually a conspiracy that has been played by the political regime and did not trust vaccination. To overcome and adjust 
To such a massive challenge, DPNA decided to think and act collectively in a bottom-top approach. We gathered the efforts of the team, volunteers, local stakeholders, various local NGOs, excuse me, to reach to the people in a way or another. Who is DPNA? We stand for Development for People and Nature Association. We are a local NGO that started in 2003, working as a part of a whole of civil society organizations towards sustainable development and meeting the needs of vulnerable communities. To respond to the pandemic and reach the largest number of individuals possible through vaccination and awareness, DPNA ensured and conducted the following four initiatives. First, um, uh, Catherine, could you please uh, share the slides? Thank you. First, we built on our WASH interventions in informal settlements of Syrian refugees, where the team is already familiar with. From here, we organized face-to-face -face talks with Syrian refugees and focus groups to first listen and learn about their concerns. Then, inform them with evidence-based knowledge and importance of the vaccine. The second, uh, please, the second slide, please. A uh, second initiative was acknowledging the importance of governmental hospitals, and especially in the socioeconomic situation in the country. DPNA was the first to rehabilitate and equip the vaccination center in the Saida Governmental Hospital in the south of Lebanon that is located on the borders of one of the largest Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon trained staff and volunteers were present on daily basis to assist marginalized communities. By first sharing information about the vaccination process, register the comers on the COVAX platform and to assist in the actual vaccination, as we can see in the um, slideshow. By doing so with the face-to-face -face conversations, we encouraged a community level engagement where the volunteers spoke the same language of the marginalized community and gained their trust. The third initiative was to increase the reach of COVID and, and vaccination awareness. We installed mobile booths in public squares and neighborhood in the city. This gave marginalized population accessibility to the needed information as volunteers shared their own experience with the vaccine and assisted the elderly to register on the platform targeting both Lebanese and migrant communities. The last approach that DPNA was part of, in partnership with local NGOs, we mobilized about 200 volunteers to take part and support in the vaccination marathons that were organized by the Ministry of Health in Lebanon and UNICEF, through which that we targeted marginalized populations such as people with disabilities, elderly, Syrian refugees, and Palestinian refugees. Mainly, we walked with people through the whole vaccination process from reaching the hospital, registering on the CalVax platform, and getting vaccinated. Now, I would like to turn to Ms. Susanna from Save the Children Lebanon uh, to talk deeply about the, uh, about the vaccination marathons that were implemented. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Diana, and thank you for all the panelists here today. Um, well, we took two different approaches that I'd like to shed on, light on today. The first approach was via small focus groups in different and difficult to access informal settlements. Um, to be able to do this, we conducted an assessment with the community leaders to be able to determine the needs and the barriers that the community was facing at the time. Um, and this is basically where we confirmed, as many of my colleagues had previously said, uh, the lack of trust and the misinformation that was present, as well as the inaccessibility of individuals to even register for the vaccination. We implemented small focus groups and workshops where we had our staff and volunteers interact on a one-on-one -on -one basis, as well as uh, within a group to share stories and to create a, a familiar ground uh, where both parties felt safe and uh, able to express themselves and uh, share their in-kin um, 
their experiences or their thoughts on the vaccination or COVID itself. So we were able to support all individuals who wanted to register for the vaccination. We provided personal protective equipment and discussed evidence-based studies, uh, leaving the beneficiaries with the ability to take an autonomous decision about whether they would like to take the vaccine or not. And through these activities, we were able to overcome the barriers of misinformation and inaccessibility uh, to the means needed to register for the vaccination. Now, um, our second approach was through the marathon that Diana had already mentioned. Uh, this marathon was uh, organized by the Ministry of Public Health with the support of UNICEF. And as UNICEF partners, we both, Save the Children and ZPNA, uh, were asked to participate as well as support the organization and the registration during this event. Now, uh, this event took place all over Lebanon. It was um, in the south, in the north, and everywhere that had a hospital. Um, and during this event, we mobilized um, all of our volunteers and staff to have access to anyone that was interested um, in taking the vaccine. But as already read, uh, mentioned, we prioritized the marginalized communities, the refugees, the immigrant workers, and people with disabilities. Now, during this marathon, we were able to support a large amount of individuals to be able to register for the vaccine, and we ensured that no one left uh, feeling unsatisfied or unvaccinated. And as previously, previously stated, in many different countries, uh, during these difficult times, people are really... Um, have been pushed to neglect their health and to neglect COVID um, and focus on their means of survival instead of on their health. Um, so being able to make a small impact, no matter how minor um, our work is, is truly what matters at the end of the day. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you to you both for giving us a perspective um, from Lebanon. It was really wonderful to hear. I have just a few questions if the panelists can all join. We have a few minutes now and I'm trying to monitor the chat and see if there are some specific questions um, that have come up that I'm hoping we can answer now. If I can, if Dr. Lawal is still able to, to join us, there's a specific question for you, Dr. Lawal. Um, hello, yes. So the specific question um, from a participant is, how did the issue of valid documentation to register for the vaccine? How was that resolved? Hi, uh, thank you for sharing the question. Well, uh, it was resolved on the level of vaccination, of course, not to make uh, not valid uh, documentation valid, you know, the complex situation of uh, such a procedure. So you know, the other approach was the following. Uh, the National Center of Disease of Control was in need of orientation how to include people who don't have a resident permit in the country, because at first they want to obtain the database of immigration department, but this one is missing many people, missing uh, uh, illegal migrants, missing uh, refugees and asylum seekers as well. So uh, the advocacy was to, to make the registration platform a bit flexible because when it was done for the Libyans, it contains a certain format that you fill for the national number. But then when you go to, to non-Libyans, if you, if you provide them, uh, a specific format that many will not register. So for the registration, it was an open format that you enter any letter or any number. So by this case, we managed that anyone can, can provide that. And we even went an extra mile for this saying for illegal migrants because they don't have attestation from IOM. There's not a, such a system. Also, we, we helped in that saying maybe a phone number or an address can be enough. That was, that was for a limited period of time because when uh, the Ministry of Health brought more vaccines, they stopped the registration. It started a mass campaigning, it started uh, since late uh, July and still uh, going on. So even for the registration platform, it says now it's become inactive, giving that people can just uh, go to the nearest uh, vaccination facility. They ask for any kind of ID just to, to, to record it and to also with a phone number to in case to follow up on the second shot or if someone who's coming in and there was a shortage of vaccine cards that happens from time to another, you get the vaccine. The system is still not uh, that sophisticated system, uh, computer based, it's just in a few centers, but the other is still a manual system. So we made those steps to prevent any, uh, 
uh, any difficulties and also through the community mobilizers like uh, Asil here that we advise that each one talk to their community to inform that in case you didn't get a vaccine card or that been a long time for the first shot you should approach to our uh, our hotline and we can arrange for that uh, through the national center of disease control uh, thank you wonderful thank you so much for answering that question I believe the next question is for um, Mr. Mendegere, if he is still able to, to join us um, and has audio. So I think for Mr. Mendegere, um, I think one question that arose is, can you comment a bit on whether or not there are outbreaks that are happening in many of the remote indigenous communities? Sí, efectivamente, te, hemos tenido brotes el año pasado. Eh, ha habido como 20 mil casos de COVID en pueblos indígenas. Este año, eh, solo 2,500, es decir, se ha reducido casi 10 veces menos. Y esto es porque el Estado ha intervenido con un conjunto de acciones de prevención principalmente. Les hemos entregado mascarillas, les hemos, en, les hemos entregado eh, insumos de higiene, les hemos enseñado a lavarse las manos, a, a utilizar el alcohol eh, en gel. Eh, hemos eh, eh, capacitado a los agentes comunitarios de salud. Les hemos entregado información eh, a través de las emisoras, eh, los altoparlantes, eh, con megáfonos. También hemos implementado brigadas de salud itinerantes que son conformadas por médicos, enfermeras, biólogos técnicos, además acompañado de enlaces indígenas, que es un indígena de la comunidad que acompaña para que ellos puedan interactuar con la comunidad y no haya ese choque cultural. Y ellos han recorrido las cuencas de los ríos para eh, descartar tempranamente la enfermedad, eh, tratarlas. Eh, también hemos comprado concentradores de oxígeno, hemos llevado... Eh, eh, centros de oxígeno terapia en muchos lugares para llevarlos hasta allí. Eh, hemos puesto aviones, helicópteros, eh, em, embarcaciones fluviales, todo lo que el Estado tiene para atender a nuestros hermanos. A pesar de eso, hemos tenido eh, casi 500 fallecidos hermanos indígenas, que son nuestros cuidadores de nuestra biodiversidad. Este año los, las defunciones han, no superan las 150 y estamos asignando más recursos, más presupuesto. En nuestros próximos días estaremos aprobando un decreto supremo que transfiere recursos para combustible, para llevar vacunas, para llevar brigadas de salud, pruebas de diagnóstico, para hacer vigilancia epidemiológica y que el personal de salud siga recorriendo las comunidades nativas. Eh, una de las cosas que quería señalar también es que la vacunación en los pueblos indígenas tiene enfoque territorial. Es decir, las brigadas ingresan, vacunan a todos los que tienen mayores de 18 años. Mientras que en las ciudades, en las grandes capitales, la vacunación ha sido por grupos de edad. Porque las vacunas han ido llegando poco a poco. Entonces tuvimos que ir dosificando y entregando las vacunas primero a la, al personal de primera línea, a los adultos mayores y luego va bajando por edades. Ahora ya se está vacunando a todos, pero en las comunidades nativas y en las comunidades campesinas se vacuna a todos desde el comienzo. Por eso era importante tener protocolos, era importante la capacitación, el material educativo en su propia lengua, y ahora hemos diversificado y vamos a, y vamos a entregar más información a población indígena. Wonderful. Thank you so, so very much for, for answering that. I have, I think I have time for, for one more question that I would like to ask um, for actually Ms. Grable, as well as Ms. Hachicho and Ms. Bukzam, if I can ask each of you the same question to comment on this. There was a question in the chat um, really about have the volunteer refugees been trained in your respective approaches? And if you can talk a little bit about that. So maybe we can start with Ms. Grable. Sure, sorry, Who, which was the audience to be trained in this approach? So here the, the participant was interested in hearing about the volunteer refugees. 
So our teams who have been trained in this are in particular to our Mercy Corps uh, staff, as well as those community committee members. So uh, our training materials are all open access. And so if other people want to use them to train people, you're, you're more than welcome to. And also you're welcome to email me with any questions that you have or if you want to, to talk about it. Um, and if you want me to walk you through the process, I'm happy to do that. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Grable. Maybe I can turn it over to Ms. Hachicho and Ms. Buxam to also comment on this. Thank you, doctor. Um, yes, concerning the volunteers, before mobilizing them on field, we, uh, and depending on where the situation they're gonna be working with, uh, we train them, of course, uh, about the vaccine, about capac uh, capacity building, uh, communication skills, um, even conflict resolution, just to avoid any um, misunderstanding on field. So they were well trained before being mobilized on, uh, on site. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. I think the final question I will ask and I will pose it to any panelists that would, um, that would like to, to perhaps answer this question. Um, there was a question in the chat um, for any of the communities that you're working with. Can you briefly discuss or touch upon the ways in which religion may contribute to vaccine hesitancy or vaccine acceptance? So I will open it up for any of the panelists to, to answer. Yes, Mr. Mendegari. Sí, bueno, efectivamente, eh, eh, entre los movimientos antivacunas aparece grupos religiosos que a las uh, comunidades les han dicho que les va a aparecer una marca 666 en la frente. Eh, o que les han dicho que eh, la voluntad de Dios es que eh, no se vacunen, eh, que ellos se van a curar de manera natural y que finalmente si alguien tiene que morir será por voluntad divina. Bueno, ante eso lo que hemos hecho nosotros es acercarnos a los líderes religiosos, llevarles la información, implementar la metodología del diálogo intercultural, que es un espacio donde un profesional, un facilitador, capacita, escucha en primer lugar las preguntas, las dudas, las inquietudes, eh, las creencias eh, sobre la vacunación y sobre la vacuna eh, de la población. Luego uno les explica la verdad científica, les eh, muestra incluso enseñándoles eh, la, la misma vacuna, las jeringas, porque además de la creencia religiosa hay eh, que se le está instalando un chip, o, o que este, se va a alterar genéticamente el ADN de ellos, en fin. Entonces se les muestra la vacuna, la jeringa, y luego de mostrarle la explicación, finalmente la población acepta. Y en forma simbólica, hacemos que el pastor de esa religión, hacemos que el APU de la comunidad sea el primero en vacunarse. Al dar el ejemplo, el APU, el jefe de la comunidad, la población generalmente suele aceptar. Pero este es un proceso largo, eh, requiere tiempo, requiere mucha paciencia. Muchas veces, a pesar de que con los APOs llegamos a unos acuerdos, la población decide no aceptar la decisión del APO. En otros casos, sí lo es. Entonces, eh, nosotros consideramos, según los estudios que se han hecho, que hay 30% aproximadamente de la población indígena que eh, ha postergado la vacunación. Y eso es porque la información científica, la información verdadera aún no les ha llegado. Entonces, esas posiciones van cambiando en la medida que vamos interactuando y en la medida que van viendo que sus pastores, sus jefes van vacunándose y no les ha pasado nada. A las mujeres le han hecho creer que es una forma de esterilizarlos, les han dicho que sus parejas no van a tener el mismo desempeño sexual. Todas esas creencias hay que eh, desbaratarlas con información científica, con comprensión de su cultura, de su cosmovisión y sobre todo con mucho respeto. Cuando eso ocurre, creo que hay posibilidades de seguir avanzando con la vacunación y en ese esfuerzo, sin duda, es importante la participación de las organizaciones religiosas, de sus líderes, eh, es importante eh, de eh, los, los jefes de las comunidades, las propias organizaciones indígenas, que con su organización y su disciplina social 
puedan contribuir en el esfuerzo que hace los estados en el mundo entero. A eso hay que añadir la cooperación, tanto privada como la de la sociedad civil y todas las demás instituciones a todo nivel. Thank you so much, Dr. Or Mr. Mendegare. I appreciate you walking us through that process. I want to, to thank, um, I know there's a few other questions, but I'm just being cognizant of time. So I just want to thank all of the panelists for joining today and for, I think, detailing out some interesting approaches with regards to how to reach these populations, as well as putting links in the chat with regards to resources. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Noreen Nakfi over from UNICEF for a closing remarks. So over to you, Noreen. Hi, Rupali. Thanks, everyone. I'll be very brief. I know there is not much time, but I um, just want to say one thing. And on behalf of uh, the subgroup of uh, on migrants and refugees and low resource setting uh, through the collective service, I want to really thank Rupali for a few. Uh, first, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank Julio, Lawal, Amina Muda. I mean, it was so wonderful, really. I wish that we had at least one more hour to hear all what we've been hearing. Um, really a reality check, somebody just um, chatted. Uh, Nicole, Diana, Susanna, uh, everyone. Um, I want to also really thank, there are some people who really made this thing happen today and brought everyone together. Uh, Catherine, of course, I cannot thank you enough for always uh, being uh, with us, leading us. Catherine from USCR, Carlos, Monica, everyone who contributed today. But I want to say two things uh, at the end. We talk about, uh, we talk at the global level a lot about uh, hard to reach communities, vulnerable. I mean, today we really learned what it takes to be working with them and how wonderfully you built their capacity. You didn't really go and do the work. You built capacity, empowered them. Uh, I think that is the, the key message that we have to take with all of us. The best thing for today's webinar was that it was a joint effort of so many organizations. I did not take names of organizations today, and that was the most wonderful thing for me, at least. Um, I We will be sharing the report uh, with all of you. But just to say that this communication, this interaction will continue. Um, we will definitely revise our work plan according to what we learned from all of you. And we would like to learn a little bit more and deeper from all of the presenters today and other people who posted links in the chat. So thanks everyone, all the best for today and huge thanks for this really wonderful uh, participation today. Thank you.